Hi, everyone. I am going to be talking about our readings and the reading strategies today. So let's go ahead and share the screen so we can jump into our Canvas page. Okay, so the first reading I had you guys review is The Significance of Grit by Deborah Perkins Gow, um, who was interviewing Angela Lee Duckworth in that article. That article was an interview. Um, and the strategy that we used was making predictions. So first of all, I had you guys make predictions so that you could see um, what that reading strategy does for you um, and why you would wanna um, make a prediction about a reading or, or know something about that reading before you get into it is so you know how you have to read it, right? It helps knowing that this is an interview so that you can see the conversations going back and forth. It also helps you to know that um, this is gonna be about psychology, right? Um, it also helps you to know that this is, you're reading this for a class. So this is information you probably want to be able to retain. Um, so making predictions just helps you think about how you're going to approach the reading, what kind of notes you're going to take, if you need to take notes, and just kind of prepare you mentally for the subject matter that you're about to read. Um, now on to the reading itself. Um, so obviously this is about grit, and as Angela Lee Duckworth explained, um, grit is about passion and perseverance, right? It's about being dedicated to something for the long term. Um, and it is a really, um, I think a good strategy or a good quality to have when you're in college because it's not a short endeavor that you're embarking on, right? You're not gonna get your degree tomorrow. It takes years to get your college degree. So that's something you understand when you're going into college is this is a commitment and this is something that's gonna take quite a bit of your time, right? So um, you need to be prepared for the fact that it's a marathon, right? Like Angela Lee Duckworth is saying, it's not a race, it's not gonna be over quickly, it's a marathon. So you have to be prepared um, to go through all the different challenges and stresses that you're gonna have as a college level student, right? And that's, um, that's something that is, is important to understand, right? I, I wish life would, would pause so that you can just deal with school and so that you don't have any other complications or stresses or problems in your life. Um, but unfortunately, that's just not how life works, right? So at the same time as you're trying to get your degree, all the other things in life are still happening. Um, and those things may derail your success. So it's, it's good to think about, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to build up my strength and my fortitude to stay committed to what I'm doing? Now understand this, there has been some pushback on concepts like grit and growth mindset um, in that it's the school system telling you, you have to be gritty when the school system doesn't actually do things to accommodate students. And we're seeing those gaps right now, particularly in the pandemic, that not all students have access to internet. Not all students can afford the textbooks. Not all students have a place to study quietly at home or to even attend classes that they've enrolled in. Right, and to just tell people, oh, well, you just need to be tough about it. You just need to be gritty. Um, ignores those challenges that some students face, right? So um, I wanna be careful about how we're framing grit and not, and not just have you guys think about, oh, well, if I fail something, I'm not gritty. That's, that's not the case at all. Sometimes it's the systemic issues that cause people to fail, not their grit level. Um, and sometimes things just become so overwhelming from, for a person that they might have to take a break, hit pause on their education. That too isn't being, um, you know, ungritty or not gritty. That's understanding your needs as a human and, and coming back to education when you can and when you're better prepared to handle those kinds of things. So we want to be careful about what we're thinking about grit, right? Sometimes, yes, it's necessary to be gritty and to really push yourself and challenge yourself and understand um, you know, that school is a long-term commitment, but we also have to understand that everybody's circumstances are different, and it's wrong to just accuse people of not being gritty when they're unsuccessful. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed this article and you kind of understood what she was saying, too. Um, much like Carol Dweck, they're talking about, you know, talent's great. If you have talent, good for you. That's awesome. But you have to cultivate that talent. Talent doesn't get people to success. Okay, that you have to be willing to put in the work and that that, that um, challenge isn't going to just be an overnight, that work isn't going to be overnight, right, that you're committing to it long term um, because it's something you're passionate about, something that you want. So kind of passion and perseverance, 
right? Sticking to something even when it gets tough over talent, all right? Okay, so let's take a look at our next reading and reading strategy. And that was the habits of mind. There's a little bit of lag. Okay, here we go. So for this reading, I had you guys read with a purpose. Um, and that has you like figuring out why you're reading a text, right? You have a purpose. There's a reason why you're reading a particular text. And if you know your purpose, right, it helps you read the text a little bit um, better, right? Like, are you gonna have a quiz on this? If so, maybe you should take notes on that, right? Um, is it something that you're gonna have to use in an essay? If so, maybe take some notes about it. Is this something the professor is gonna be discussing um, in, a, in a class lecture? If so, maybe jot down some questions or comments or, or um, some things you can use in a class discussion, right? So understanding what you're supposed to be doing with the reading before you start doing the reading helps you actually approach that reading and be prepared for whatever's coming next after that reading. Okay, so I asked you guys to think about why I assigned this reading, um, right? And is there any other strategies that you might need to achieve? And that this is something that's in uh, achieved success and that this is something that is gonna be used for essay one. Okay, so, um, hopefully that had you thinking about, um, you know, why you're reading this article and, and the fact that, yeah, it could come up in essay one. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and had you thinking about different maybe note-taking techniques. So let's talk about the habits of mind. So it was a pretty short article um, and it was written by the CWPA and some other organizations that they got together and, and concluded that these eight habits of mind right, curiosity, persistence, metacognition, engagement, flexibility, creativity, responsibility, and openness um, are essential for success in college writing and beyond, right? And, and basically what they're saying is, is successful in all credit-bearing um, college-level classes. So um, I like this because I think these are some, some pretty good qualities for one to have or, or, or possess. Um, so if we start with curiosity, curiosity is important because it's kind of the whole reason why we have universities, right? A bunch of people looking to find answers and then share those answers with, with everybody else. It's the bedrock of education in our university system, right? We're endeavoring to find out more about ourselves, our environment, these different subjects, and then, um, right, protect that knowledge and pass it on um, per, or preserve that knowledge and pass it on. So um, how it applies to you is, yeah, it's good to be curious, right? If you see something that we're mentioning in class or in one of these readings and you want to look up further, you know, about the author or about these concepts or how it could apply to you, I encourage you to do that. Um, that was one of the things that I found really helpful for me when I was in college was um, looking up beyond what we were looking at in class, right? Find, like I said, finding more information about these authors that were writing these articles that I had written or excuse me, that I was reading, or, you know, look more into the topic. It allows you to have a richer experience. And I'll tell you, that's, um, that's one of those things about college education, is you're going to get out what you put in. And, um, you know, the more you go digging around, the more information you're going to have on certain topics. So curiosity is a great thing. Next up, we have persistence, also known as grit, right? And we just talked about grit and why that's important because this is a long-term endeavor that you're that you're doing here right college is not overnight um metacognition this one is a little bit tricky right um the way they kind of explain it doesn't make it super clear to students so i'm going to tell you um how to break this down so with metacognition it's thinking about thinking essentially so right now here's the little exercise i do to have you think about what metacognition is and understand what metacognition is. So think about how you learn. Um, there's a couple different types of learners. We think of visual learners, and those are people that they need to see what's going on. They need to see like illustrations or examples um, to really help cement the concept in their brain, right? They have to see what's going on, visual learners. Um, there's audio learners, right? And they need to hear 
what's going on. They need to, you know, have instructions repeated or, um, you know, they don't want to just focus on visual. They don't have to focus on visual. They need to hear what the instructor is, is saying. Um, and then there's kinesthetic learners. And kinesthetic learners are what we call hands-on, right? You learn by doing. It's great to see somebody do something or hear them give you instructions, but for you to really grasp the concept, you have to try it yourself, right? And then some people are combinations. Like I myself am a visual kinesthetic. I need to see somebody do something first, give me an example, and then I want to try it myself. And that's how I learn best. Watch somebody do it and then try it myself, right? Um, so take just a second and think about how do you learn? Are you a visual learner, an audio learner, a kinesthetic learner, or a combination of all three of those? So think about it for a second. Think, think, think. Audio, visual, kinesthetic, or combo. Okay, do you know what you are? Okay, good. That is an example of metacognition. I had you thinking about the way you think. You were thinking about how do I learn? How does my brain work? How do I think when I'm trying to process new information? That's metacognition, metacognition right? It's kind of this thinking about how we think, thinking about the grand structures and narratives in our society. So why is it good? Well, of course, it's good to know how you learn. That way you can be responsible for your learning. Maybe, like I said, if you're a visual learner, you need to sit in a place in a classroom, once we're able to go back to the classroom, where you can really see what the instructor is doing or be able to see the whiteboard, um, right? Or so you can request maybe a demonstration of something for an instructor. If you're a, an audio person, right, maybe you need to sit in a different place in the classroom. Um, and if you're a kinesthetic learner, well, then you know, right? I need to watch this person do it and then I'm, I need to be ready to try it on my own. So it really helps you figure out um, how to approach learning when you know what kind of learner you are. Engagement. Um, engagement means like how invested you are in something, right? Um, something that you want to do. Something that you want to do. It's, it's compliance is have to. Engagement is want to. I want to do this, right? And, and to make you feel like you're invested and involved in your learning. And that's really important. If you're not engaged, then you're not going to really be learning and you're going to be bored and you're going to tune out and and that's not great, right? So um, we want to find ways to keep you engaged. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes you'll have really engaging professors who make class fun and exciting, and you know, you're going to be working with groups, and it's really interactive. Um, and that's great, right? You'll be engaged in that class. But not all instructors teach that way. And especially right now, since we're all online, it's been a little bit difficult for professors to try to translate what they do in a very engaging classroom and put that online. Um, so what I'm trying to say is sometimes you have to make engagement happen, right? How, what can you do to make sure you stay engaged, involved, invested, focused on what you're doing, right? Because like I said, sometimes the instructor is not going to be holding a really super engaging class, then it becomes up to you to try to figure out how to stay invested. Um, flexibility, our next one. Flexibility is good to have because, well, you're, you're gonna have to change a lot as you're moving from semester to semester. You get all new teachers, all new classes, a whole new schedule, right? And um, your plan for when and where and how you're gonna take your classes might not actually work out and you might have to switch your schedule around. So flexibility is a great trait to have and not just in school also, but outside in the working world, it's good to be flexible. Up next, we have creativity. Creativity is awesome. It kind of goes along with curiosity. Creativity is what helps, you know, drive progress in our society. It's something that is now considered like a commodity, right? These big companies aren't just looking for um, people with with a certain like skill set or degree. They're also looking for creative people, right? Because that's kind of where um, the market is, especially the digital market with creating apps and new technologies. They need creative people who are going to be designing these new apps, these new technologies. Um, and so it's an asset, right? And it can also really help you learn trying to do something creatively instead of just trying to go with, um, you know, like kind of reading articles and taking notes. What's another creative way you can absorb the content? All right, check out YouTube. A lot of people do really interesting, creative things to teach others or teach themselves things like, you know, the parts of speech or the periodic table of elements or, or things like that. Um, creativity is really important in education and beyond. 
Up next, we have responsibility. And I think that one kind of speaks for itself, but still it's good to go over this. So obviously responsibility is, is important to success because it means you're taking ownership of what you're doing and you're understanding the commitment that you took on. And again, that's something that's not just valuable in an academic setting, but also in the outside working world too. Um, and then our last one is openness. And openness sounds just like what it is, right? It's being open to new ideas, new ways of thinking, and new ways of learning. And if you're gonna be here at college, you should be open, right? Because um, that's what you're being presented with, new ways of thinking, new ideas, new, um, new perspectives. And it also really helps you understand yourself and others when you're open. Um, and this is something I, I challenge students to do, um, not just in classrooms, but also you know, out in the world. Um, you know, you don't have to buy into everything everybody's saying, and you don't have to agree with what everybody's saying. But I always tell students, you know, um, listen to all different sides of an argument. Be open to listening to what people have to say, and then think about it, evaluate it, interpret it, um, and make your own decision on, on that idea. Some ideas are just trash and garbage and aren't worth our respect or um, worth us agreeing with them. But if you know what's being said about a certain topic, if you're open to hearing, then you have a better understanding and can make decisions better for yourself. So these are the eight habits of mind, and they are really great habits to possess in college, but also beyond in the working world. Next, let's get into brainology, which is one of my favorite articles and the one that really changed my own thinking about how I learn and, and my own educational history. Um, so with this one, I had you guys focus on summarizing. That's our particular um, reading strategy for this. And I did this for two reasons. Um, one, you're gonna need to know how to summarize because that's something we're gonna be doing in all of our essays this semester. And it's something you're gonna do in a lot of different uh, assignments or, or papers that you write in college is first kind of situating the circumstances for your reader. They need to know what it is you're talking about. Um, and so oftentimes you're gonna have to give your readers like a brief summary of what it is you're discussing or the reading that you're discussing, um, something like that. But the second reason I also had you guys summarize for this article is this is the number one choice that people write about for essay number one. They pick brainology to write about for essay one. So um, part of our essay one is gonna be summarizing and then making the connection to yourself. So I decided let's kind of do something with this that's gonna be useful to most of the class when we sit down to write that essay. Um, so brainology summary, is if you, you know, I'll get your feedback on it, but if it's done right, basically you get to just plot that summary right into your essay. Okay, so we'll go over um, this reading. So I did have a bonus video here and um, you know, Carol Dweck herself has talked about going beyond just what she wrote in that article. And she actually has a book on um, fixed and growth mindset. Um, but much like grit, there has been some pushback on this, right? So in the article, Brainology, what Carol Dweck is, is, is trying to explain to us is that when it comes to um, success in education, um, there are usually two types of mindsets. And the more successful mindset is the growth mindset, right? Um, and the growth mindset is when you believe that your, um, your intelligence and your skill level can improve, it can grow. And that growth is based on your effort. If you put in more work, if you put in more practice, um, eventually over time, as we learned with this great article, you'll get better and better. Again, it's not overnight, but it will happen if you continue to put in the effort. Now, here's the thing. It's not just any old effort, okay? Um, have you ever heard the saying, practice makes perfect? It doesn't. Perfect practice makes perfect. So if you show up to practice and you're sloppy, that's how you're gonna perform on game day. So what Dweck is, is really trying to focus on here is the effort, right? Effort is what really matters. And you have to put in you know, the good effort, the hard effort, and not just the sloppy effort. Otherwise, you're not gonna see any progress. Okay, so that's the definition of, of the growth mindset, right? A person who believes that their intelligence and abilities can grow with effort, good effort. Um, what are the outcomes of having a growth mindset? Well, students 
or more successful um, because they try different things, right? If something doesn't work for them, they try a new way of doing something. Let's say just taking notes in, in class isn't working, they'll try something different, right? And when they hit a brick wall or when they fail, they don't give up. They pick themselves up instead and they figure out what they did wrong and how they can learn from those mistakes and move beyond them, right? They're also more willing to take on challenges, as Dr. Dweck explained, because they see that if I take on that challenge and I work at it, if I conquer that challenge, well, then I've grown, I've become better, I've learned more, right? And then they're also not going to cheat because they're invested in their learning and they care about actually having that knowledge as opposed to just looking smart, right? They care about actually having that, that knowledge base. Um, so that's what leads them to success, right? And what is causing this growth mindset? Um, as Dr. Dweck explains, it's how parents and teachers frame our success and, and how we work. So for growth mindset, if you want to foster a growth mindset, as I was saying, we have to focus on effort. So instead of saying, oh, you're so smart, you would say, oh, you worked really hard, right? The focus should be on the effort and not on intelligence, not on talent, but on the hard work that somebody is putting into what it is they're learning or, or trying to achieve, right? It's all about the hard work. So she's saying parents should stop and coaches and teachers should stop trying to just focus on intelligence, right? Because it's the hard work we wanna focus on. On the flip side, we have the fixed mindset and the fixed mindset obviously believes that their intelligence and abilities are fixed, that no matter how much effort they put in, they're never gonna be better than they are right now. And that's kind of a dangerous mindset, right? Because then it sets us up for bad things. If we hit a brick wall, well, we're gonna give up, right? Because we believe, well, I'm no good at this anyways, I might as well just give up. I'm not gonna be a mathematician, I'm never gonna be any better, so why waste my time putting in that effort, right? Um, and because of that, they're more likely to cheat, um, right? Because they also care about looking that perceived facade of intelligence, right? They care about looking for it rather than actually learning the material. And that's because they've maybe had the focus on intelligence and not on effort. And so they don't want to look dumb. They don't want to prove to family or friends or teachers or coaches that they're not intelligent, um, right? So, and they won't take on as many challenges because the challenge you could fail at, right? If it's hard for you, you could fail and failure just um, reinforces that, that fixed mindset that, well, I'm not good at this. I'm never going to be good at this. I might as well just give up. Um, and, and what causes this mindset is, right, the opposite, like I was saying, when teachers, parents, and coaches focus on intelligence and talent, right? Oh, you're so good. Oh, you're so talented. Oh, you're so smart, instead of focusing on the effort. So as Dweck is saying, yeah, talent's great, right? Like Angela Lee Douglas, talent is great. And we can't deny it. Some people are just more talented at things in life than others. But effort is what really matters, okay? If you have talent and you don't put any effort, you're not going to cultivate that talent. And it's not going to turn into something successful for you, right? The effort is the key there. Um, now, like I was saying, much with the grit idea, there's been some pushback, right, by saying, um, you know, this mindset doesn't always lead to success. And even Carol Dweck has addressed this. Again, if you're curious, I would look up, you know, the, the brainology myth or Carol Dweck's response um, because many people misinterpreted her, her ideas when she first released the, this article on this work, um, you know, and they were just kind of focused on the mindset, you know, think you can, think you can, think you can, and you will. And that's not true, right? As Dweck said, it's the effort. We have to be focusing on the effort. Being positive and happy is great, but it's the effort that really matters, okay? So you have to tell yourself, yes, you can do it, but that's not the end. Growth mindset means getting to work, putting in the effort, right? And then, like I said, with grit, we also understand not everybody has the same opportunities, right? And so sometimes it can be really hard to have a growth mindset if again, you don't have the proper materials, the proper supplies, the proper place to, to study, if you don't have support from family or friends or you're struggling financially or you're struggling with mental health, right? Those things can really impact your ability to put in that effort. So we wanna understand that too. And I want you guys to, to know that just because again, you're struggling with something doesn't mean you have a fixed mindset, okay? Um, 
and that I, I understand too that our students are facing different challenges and and especially during this pandemic and so it's not always possible to put in like 100 percent full effort sometimes you do have to kind of pull it back and sometimes you do your best but it's not 100 percent right and i'm okay with that um i'm i'm looking for you guys to do your best and sometimes your best some days your best might be like just half of what you could normally do and that's okay. As long as you're trying, you're putting in the effort and you're doing the best you can on that particular day, that's what I care about. And that's what eventually is gonna lead you to progress, that you're putting in the effort and that you're trying. Um, and that you also you know, keep telling yourself, I can do this and, and I can persevere, but it's the effort. You have to try and you have to put in the good effort to get better at things. Okay, so let's move on from here. We're gonna go into, let's get beyond the summary. I've disappeared. Okay, we're going to go out the long way. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Well, that's going to be on the blogs. And we'll go out the long way. So, one of the other articles that I had you guys read was. Um, laziness does not exist, which kind of challenges those notions that we're reading about in um, brainology and the significance of grit. Um, but let's go into the drive. This is the next one. Sorry, there's a little bit of lag. Okay, so for Drive Chapter 5, I had you all annotate and underline, which this is probably one of the most popular and go-to strategies for students, is underlining and annotating. Um, now, there's a reason why I have both things, underlining and annotating. A lot of students are just used to like underlining an idea or highlighting an idea, and that's great. But why did you do that, right? When you come back to study, what good is that? highlight or underline going to do for you if you don't know the significance of why you did the highlighting or the underlining. And that was something that I noticed when I was working with students in writing centers is they would bring their reading and, you know, they'd have their reading and they'd have their highlights and their underlines. And I would ask them, you know, why did you highlight this? What's, what's this concept here? And they would look at it and go, you know what, I don't know. And they'd have to reread what they had highlighted or what they had underlined. And sometimes they couldn't even really remember why they they did the highlights and the underlines. Um, so what you should do is as you're highlighting or underlining, you also put a little note out to yourself to explain why this is an important concept, okay? And that way, when you're reviewing your notes or you're reviewing that text, you don't have to reread that entire passage and try to remember why it's important or it's significant. It's highlighted or underlined, and there's a little note to yourself explaining why this passage is important. So keep that in mind. When you highlight and um, underline, you should also be annotating. And that doesn't mean you have to write a whole bunch of notes, maybe just one or two words, something that will um, you know, kind of trigger your memory and, and so that you can understand why you are highlighting or underlining, okay? Um, so what we looked at for this chapter uh, was Drive, and this comes from the book Drive, um, and it's about motivation. It's about what pushes people to do what they do. Um, particularly in business. This is what this book is about. But a lot of the concepts that Dan Pink describes in his book actually apply to education as well. And so chapter five was all about mastery, right? And Daniel Pink describes mastery as getting better and better at something that matters to you, right? Um, and he talks about these three different, and before we get there, talks about compliance versus engagement, right? And if you're if you're in an environment where you have to comply, you have to do something, um, that doesn't lead to mastery because you're just doing something because you have to do it. You're not really engaged in it. Whereas with engagement, you're doing something because you want to do it. And therefore, um, you're more interested and it matters to you. And that does lead to mastery. Right? And we'll get into what Dan Pink says about mastery in just a minute here, how it doesn't really ever come to fruition for people. Um, 
So next he talks about these, these three things that um, we need to know about mastery. He says, uh, mastery is a pain, right? And that connects back to grit, right? That's what she's saying. Um, that it takes passion and perseverance. And that's the same thing that Daniel Pink is saying. He's saying, you know, mastery is a pain. It's going to be painful um, trying to get better and better at something because it's going to take effort and you have to push and challenge yourself, right? It's not going to be easy is essentially what he's saying. Um, the next thing he says is that mastery is a mindset, right? And what he's referring there to there is actually um, Carol Beck and the fixed and growth mindset, the entity um, theory, right? Versus, um, what was it? In entity versus incremental, right? Um, and that you have to have that mindset of the harder I work, the more effort I put in over a sustained amount of time is going to lead to my success, is going to lead to mastery. Um, and then his last point is that mastery is an asymptote, right? Where he says an asymptote is when two lines approach each other and they get really close, but they never meet. And so what he's saying there, right, is that we can get really, really close to mastery, but you're never really, truly ever going to master something, right? But why do people do it? Because it's about the journey. We feel better when we get better and better at something. We feel more accomplished. Um, we take pride in getting better and better at something. We take pride in trying to be the best we can be at something or being the best we can be at something, right? Um, so it doesn't really matter that we're never going to reach what is mastery. Um, it's about getting better and better. It's about the journey towards mastery. So what he's saying there is, right, this is kind of what pushes people. Um, and it can lead to your success if you understand that, right, what you're doing here is sometimes going to be painful, meaning that it's going to be hard and difficult. You need to have the right mindset and, and um, put in that effort and, uh, you know, understand that mastery is kind of an illusion and it's illusory you're not going to ever really be able to touch it but that's okay because it's about you becoming better and learning more all right so let's move on to our next one which is what i was talking about the laziness of, laziness does not exist by devon price um and i did provide a video down here for this too so that you can hear and see devon price himself talking about this concept that they wrote about um, and notice I'm using they, them pronouns. That is what um, Professor Price prefers to use. So I'm going to be respectful and use Professor Price's um, self-identifying pronouns. Okay, so for this one, our strategy was um, finding key passages or what we like to call golden lines. And we'll, we'll do this a, a few more times throughout the semester. So when we're looking for golden lines, as I've explained up here, we're looking for these key ideas, important passages from the text, right? You're looking for ideas that really explain the main ideas or give you an insight into what the author is trying to say. Um, so what I had you do for this was try to pick five golden lines, five things that stood out to you that seemed really significant um, for whatever reason. Maybe you agreed, you disagreed, you thought they were it was a good definition, whatever it is. Okay, so this is always a good note taking strategy. If your professor hasn't assigned you any notes, they just say take notes and be ready to discuss tomorrow. Jotting down a few key passages from the reading and then bringing that to class ready to discuss those key passages. There you go, right? You get your participation credit um, and you're ready to participate in, in class because you have written down some, some quotes, some passages uh, from the text. Right, so it's a good way of being able to jump into participation, um, right, and 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 demonstrate to the professor that you're participating the way he or she wants you to. Um, so it's a it's a really good go to go to strategy is golden lines. You can't go wrong with jotting down those passages, but you also want to explain why did you find this a key passage. Um, that helps with the discussion and also helps you you know figure out why you're choosing these particular passages. So um, in this article, um, Devin Price is kind of getting at the things I was talking about with those, those first two readings with um, or one and three, right, with grit and, and growth mindset, right? We, we like to think that um, if students are failing, that they're failing because they're being lazy, right, that they're not doing the work. Uh, and what, what Devin Price is trying to say is that that's not always the case. We don't set out to embark on failure, right? Nobody starts college thinking, yeah, I'd like to 
fail all my classes. I definitely want like a 1.0 GPA. Nobody does that, right? We intend on having um, success when we start any new endeavors, college included. Um, but then life happens, things happen. Um, there's different challenges we face, as I was explaining with both reading one and three, right? We all don't have the same opportunities. We all don't have the same financial support or, or emotional, mental support from family and friends um, and partners, right? It's, there, there's something there beyond laziness, that people aren't inherently lazy. And that's something else that Dan Pink was talking about in his book, that people aren't lazy. They like to be motivated. They like to be working. They like to feel like they're involved and invested in something. So this notion that people aren't successful because they're lazy isn't actually true. There's something there that's preventing them to be from being successful. And most likely it is not laziness. It's other factors, usually external factors that are going on in somebody's life. And so I wanted you guys to understand this too. And that's why I have also my grading set up the way I do in this class. Um, is so that you can, you know, still be reach success um, and you don't have to worry so much about deadlines or falling behind a little bit or if you have something serious happen in your life, um, you know, be afraid that that's going to derail you because I understand it's really hard to be engaged mentally um, and do your best when you're stressed out or you're sick, right, or, um, you know, you don't have adequate study environment. Whatever it is, those things can prevent you from, from being successful. And I want you to know that I'm here for you guys. Um, just let me know if you need extra time or if you're really struggling with something or if there's you know, something difficult going on in your life. And you don't have to give me details if you don't want to. Um, but, you know, I, I understand it's not laziness. It's other factors in your life. All right. So let's look beyond to our next reading. And this one was how teachers make children hate reading, <laughs> which I kind of did, right? Like I, I gave you guys a thing to do as you were reading this, which is something that John Holt talks about, which is like how teachers, you know, give these assignments that really kill the joy of reading. Um, but for this, I was, I was asking you guys to ask questions, um, which means like, you know, come up with questions you could ask yourself, you could ask the audience, you could ask um, the author, right? So it's a good idea to, to question a text. And again, it's something that you could use as a discussion tool. And sometimes professors will require you know, write two comments and two questions about something. Um, so developing questions is a really good way to engage with the text, to have a dialogue with the text, and to also um, bring that to class to have a discussion, right? Especially if you don't understand something, write down a question. What is this? What does he mean here? And you know, you can bring that to your professor. So Questions are a good thing. Now, what this um, article is all about, or essay, I should say, is um, what the point John Holt is trying to make is that um, school is not always a place of safety for, for some people. Um, for me, it was. I loved school. School was like, you know, my, my place I wanted to be. It was my safe place. Everything was consistent. I knew what to expect when I got to school. I loved school. Um, but that's not everybody's experience. And some people feel like school is a danger, right? And what he means by that is school is a place where you feel belittled for some people or stupid or lazy, right? That you're being told that you're lazy. Uh, some of those really negative things. So they don't look at school as, as a place where they're gonna be um, challenged in a good way and, and, and feel passionate and be motivated. For some people, school is an awful experience and that has a lot to do with how um, teachers structure their classroom or the assignments that they give or their attitudes towards students, right? And kind of the point he was making about reading was that, you know, sometimes we teachers overdo it with the reading activities and we take all the joy out of reading. Um, and we don't always just let people get into the reading and get into those ideas. We, you know, do things that <laughs> really um, kind of seem like busy work oftentimes. Um, and I really try to stay away from that, and hopefully you guys don't feel that way when we start reading Orange is the New Black and doing some book club stuff. Um, but yeah, the point he was making here is that, you know, sometimes we suck the joy out of learning, and school can be a dangerous place for people because it makes them feel, like I said, belittled, or, or like they're not smart, or like they're lazy. And so John Holt is trying to, you know, make that clear that that's something we should be moving away from, and we should be trying to invest in 
in making school a place of safety for people and also making reading enjoyable and cultivating a love of reading. I hope you guys like that one. Maybe some of you could relate to that. And then our um, last reading was I Just Want to Be Average by Mike Rose. And I like this reading too um, for a couple different reasons. But let's start with our reading strategy. I had you guys make connections um, between the text we are reading and other texts that we were reading, right? And so hopefully you saw the different mindsets and ideas that we were talking about or reading about in those other readings show up here in I Just Want to Be Average, right? You can see some of the students had six mindsets. Why did they have six mindsets? The teachers cultivated six mindsets, right? And Mike Rose didn't really get that growth mindset until he was put in Mr. McFarland's class and Mr. McFarland really cultivated a growth mindset in his students. Um, so that's what we're doing with this is I was trying to get you guys to see the connections between what was going on in this essay, Mike Rose's personal essay, and in all those other articles and how they connect over to what was going on and I just want to be average. Um, and as a quick note, if you didn't read into um, like the little biography at the top or, or look up who Mike Rose is, Mike Rose was actually a professor at UCLA. Um, so if you saw some of the schools that once rejected him, UCLA, he became a professor there later, right? Um, and also this notion of overcoming those, those labels and, and struggles. Right, he was placed in what was called like, um, you know, used to be called like development, development ed, right, dev ed, the vocational track. And that was like he said, a dumping ground where, where teachers and administrators just had this kind of nasty attitude that, well, those students aren't gonna be doctors or lawyers or white collar jobs, they're gonna be laborers. So it doesn't matter, just toss them in this classroom and, you know, glorified babysitting. And that's not the way you encourage growth mindset or student success at all. Um, students can pick up on that. And Mike Rose and, and his fellow students in those dev ed classes did pick up on that and understood that they were kind of being discarded by the educational system and, and that their classroom was just being used as a dumping ground. Um, and what he's talking about in this article, particularly, or I should say essay, is the idea that students float to the mark you set as a teacher. And what that means is, if you have low standards for students, that's where they'll meet you. And that's what was going on in that classroom, the dev ed classroom. The, teacher, the teachers had no expectations and really no respect for the students. And so the students didn't really have expectations of themselves or respect for these teachers back, um, right? But when he transferred into Mr. McFarland's class, Mr. McFarland had greater expectations and um, Mike Rose pushed himself to meet Jack McFarland's um, high expectations. And he could tell that the teacher actually cared about him and was invested in him. So he started to care more and become invested in himself and the course and improving himself, right? Um, so it's that, that standard, right? And this, this extends beyond just kind of a teacher-student relationship too, um, into like personal life. Your standards matter. Um, people will treat you how you let them treat you, right? So have high standards for yourself and, and, and make those people meet your standards. You're better than, um, you know, taking disrespect or, or that kind of stuff. So people will float to the mark you set. That's the idea here, okay? So the last thing I had you guys do was reflect on all these different readings. And so um, I asked you guys to think about which ones worked for you and which ones didn't work for you. Um, and I want you guys to really think about that as you're working through this class and into the future. You know, these were just techniques, tools I was showing you guys. You can keep the ones that work for you and discard ones that don't work for you. That's, you know, kind of the metacognition bit of, uh, of education, figuring out how you learn and what works best for you. So with that, we are going to conclude our discussion on the readings and reading strategies. And I'll see you guys next time.